Your Humanities Half Hour is brought to you by the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry, and today we have a treat. We are sitting down with the co-project coordinator of a very interesting uh, Indigenous Chamorro cultural project called Laddie of the Marianas, Dr. Kelly Marsh Titano. Dr. Kelly, welcome to the show, and welcome to Saipan. <laughs> Half a day. I always love coming up to Saipan. Saipan, Tinian, Luta. Um, I want to get to some of the other islands as well, but it has meant a lot to me. I grew up on Guahan and to connect with the rest of the archipelago and the others that are part of the archipelago, it, it's always meant a lot to me. Well, you've just had a successful book launch for the book Laddie of the Marianas. Most of our listeners know what a Laddie, a Laddie stone is, but for those who don't, what is a Laddie? Well, a Laddie, one of the things that's so important is that it's really unique. It is a house pillar. It's made out of stone. And we do have house pillars throughout the region. And so we can see those ancestral connections over thousands of years. But the Laddie are unique because they are comprised of two pieces. The Tassa, which is the capstone, and the Haligi, which is the bottom pillar portion. And so together, they work together. Uh, that's what makes it stand out compared to all the other house posts out there. I think most people are probably familiar with the uh, Guma Taga, House of Taga on Tinian with those large stone monoliths, but they also get kind of small, right? As we'll learn. Um, yes. What was your inspiration for being a part of this project and putting this book together? Well, you know, many years ago, I was a board member of the Guam Preservation Trust. I grew up on Guam as well. And so being around Lati has always been part of my life to some degree. But also as an educator, I was seeing, at least for the students that I experienced, that fewer and fewer of them knew where to find them. And even though they were proud of Lati as an icon, they didn't, they hadn't necessarily seen one or know how to find one uh, and other aspects like that. So I knew that there are those out there that have studied it, uh, that are experimenting with recapturing it to make it a living tradition again and things like this. So it seemed like a perfect time to bring it all together to make sure that the wisdom and knowledge that elders and others have is transmitted to the next generation. Can you give us a general description of what people can expect from this publication, what it contains? Well, I wanted people to be able to see many parts of our community that make up caring for and knowing about the Lati. And so in the first part of the book, it's listening to our elders and our cultural practitioners. And so we hear the wisdom that they heard from their parents and grandparents and are sharing with us about how to behave at sacred sites, uh, the importance of being guardians of sacred sites like Laddie, and so forth. In the second part, there are Laddie throughout the archipelago there are, uh, we know of hundreds of Ladi sites um, or ancestral villages really that were throughout the archipelago. And um, with that second section, it's a chance to be able to hear from the ancestors, you know, what they left behind. And so there are things in there that are particular to Lati, but also what you find at a, an ancestral village or a Lati site. From the, the Lusong to the pottery uh, and things like that. So we tried to help people be able to hear those voices uh, from their ancestors. And then in the third section, it's hearing from our artists. 
So even though there aren't many that are carving lati, uh, and it's not a living tradition, but there are some trying to recapture that, which is exciting. But we have the artists that are portraying it in so many different ways. They're carving it out of wood. They're making a glass murals in kind of a stained glass sort of a way. They're replicating um, versions of it in batik. They're painting it. They're just, you can see that it's on, in their hearts and on their minds, that deep care and love for their culture and for the lati as that iconic symbol. In the fourth section, that is about the fact that we want this to be a living legacy and continue on. I don't think any of us want to envision a Marianas where the Lati are no longer. And so in order for that to be the case, we have to figure out as a community the ways that we're going to safeguard and transmit the knowledge and the significance to the next generation. So that last section is talking about the ways in which we can do that through education, through film, through uh, some of these new things like eBooks and apps, uh, and through traditional mediums like historic preservation offices and things like that. So the last section is that consideration of the journey forward. Now you've paid particular attention to the format of this book to really make it reader friendly, visually appearing, uh, appealing. How did you, what approach did you take with that? And what can people expect with this coffee table book that is, <laughs> I think a little bit more than your average coffee table book? Well, we really wanted people to get so much out of it. Uh, I've mentioned before that I have several coffee table books. I love the visual you know, beauty and how engaging coffee table books are. But quite honestly, they're often written in chapters and, and I've never read one of my coffee table books from beginning to end. And we wanted this to be something that we know people are really hungry for the information and we wanted to be able to impart it in a way that they felt it was accessible to them. So there are over a thousand archaeology reports. There are some very good um, academic materials about Lati, but for most of us, it's not so accessible. So we really wanted to make it reader friendly and we wanted it to be in bite-sized pieces so that you could just peruse through the book, stop at a topic that you found interesting, and within three to 15 minutes, you would know the latest understanding about that particular topic. So the entries range from about 50 words to 500 words, but no longer than that. Uh, they sit on a portion of a page or a double page spread, but then it moves on to another exciting topic about Lati on the next double page spread. What has been your experience um, on the cover of the book, it says by the community, for the community, or is it the other way? For the community, by the community, one of those. <laughs> yes. What has been your experience de uh, working with, as you said, the cultural practitioners, the archeologists, the artists, the people who are working to preserve um, this part of the culture? Um, what is the feedback and the feeling you've gotten uh, bringing this all together into this project? Well, that was another thing. It was so important. We made sure that every island is represented. You know, we have, and that follows along with Lati. Lati exists throughout the archipelago. So some of those that contribute, they are from Guahan, they are from Saipan, they are from Tinian, they are from Luta. Um, and then there are even some entries from those that are living abroad, tomorrow's that are living abroad now. They're in Germany, they're in Washington state or something like that. And that way, everybody was included. Everybody who has participated has really mentioned that it's an honor to be part of the book, myself included. I've been very humbled by getting to meet so many people, uh, many I knew already, but many were people I was just meeting for the first time through this work. And so it was wonderful to work with this body of people that were so committed and passionate 
about the culture and preserving it or maintaining it, which is really important. And uh, so they've mentioned being uh, very honored to be part of it. And then when they see the work, especially when it comes all together, it's just we, I really have got to say that we've had a, an amazing graphic artist where she took all of our disparate uh, various thoughts and ideas and art pieces and everything else that we had and she wove it together in this beautiful way. It's colorful, it's vivid, it's engaging. And so people are really appreciative of that. And part of it is I think everybody who's part of the project from the graphic artist to those that are supporting like the Northern Marianas Humanities Council, it's not only something that they support, but it's, it's part of that labor of love. Like it means so much to them to be able to bring this to life. And um, yeah, just anybody who sees it, they can see the voices that are in there and, and the many different types of uh, offerings that are, are presented in there. One of the things you've mentioned is that in this project and maybe others you've been involved in, um, the elders especially and the traditional practitioners that you talk to, they're really um, very willing and open to share their knowledge. Yes, that's been my experience uh, throughout the years. Uh, I've grew up on Guam, as I mentioned, and I have been part of this cultural renaissance. You know, there wasn't a lot of public display about Chamorro arts and Chamorro skills and Chamorro knowledge. And to have been here at a time when that has flourished and blossomed has been a beautiful thing. And along the way, I've spent time over the years reaching out to cultural practitioners and elders and others. And when one goes with the intentions of truly respecting and truly being interested and being committed to the knowledge or the culture, uh, my experience has always been that people are very generous and open with what they know. It seems like, and you kind of alluded to this during your um, book launch, that this is not only an opportunity that has brought the people of the Marianas together, um, but it's also, we could also look at it in a broader sense as how it might tie Micronesia together, these stone monoliths um, that we have. What is the connection there between what we see in the Lade stone and what we see elsewhere in Micronesia? Yes, so that's been a beautiful part of the journey. This is following along the lines of perhaps an Austronesian tradition. And so we see peoples that speak the Austronesian based languages and have those ancestral connections that they have a wooden house posts or stone house posts. And if we look throughout Micronesia, we can see that there are stone house posts that are present in Yap, in Palau, in Kiribati, in the Marshall Islands, um, and a lot of the atolls, Fais, Buliai, and so forth. And so it's something that I really recognize as a way that can bring us together, that on Guam, we have Chamorro Studies classes, and I can really see the students from the other islands responding to the chanting and the dancing. And I did bring it to a couple of classes where we were teaching them how to uh, create stone tools, and then those stone tools were used for carving lati, and they really seemed to respond to it. And it occurred to me that it, was a, it could be a beautiful way for islanders to see each other and to say this is something we have in common that we use stone maybe beach rock uh, for the atolls but beach rock is also used for lati in the archipelago as well and they could see that that was yet another thing that they had in common as they were learning how to carve our guest today is dr kelly marsh titano and we'll be back with more after this break. In Northern Marianas Humanities Council, Bula Guinahanya Puri Historian Marianas Zan Kutura. 
Sinyon Soda SCC and Food Machine Gis on Mommy website nmhcouncil.org. Pat Besita Gi YouTube, Pat Facebook. Guaha Loku Diferentes Class in Le Blue Nai Sinya on Fon. In Northern Marianas Humanities Council, Hazuzura Todu E Experience and Tauta. Welcome back to Your Humanities Half Hour. We are chatting with Dr. Kelly Marsh Titano about uh, the Laddie of the Marianas Project. She is the co project coordinator. Um, Dr. Kelly, what has it meant to you personally to have coordinated um, really such a wide project on such an important icon in the um, Chamorro culture? It's meant so much. As I mentioned before, it's a labor of love. And it certainly, I appreciate those that were working alongside me. There's Dr. Julie Liston, who has worked in the region for decades herself. And then we had amazing project assistants. Monica Di Oro, Daniel Stone Jr., Eva Uggen Cruz, um, and Nicole Camacho Duenas. They were really important because when we're working with 80 people, 80 contributors, it's a lot 80? of lo yeah, wow. it's a lot of logistics, and so we need all of the hands and arms and eyes uh, that we can possibly have, and each one of them is so committed to the culture and also specifically um, most of those project assistants have been part of the lati carving and quarrying that we've been doing down at the university of guam that uh, they knew of the subject intimately had committed themselves to it for years already but through that also they have these amazing relationships with like people throughout the archipelago and that was really priceless. Like I really valued them being able to reach out to Rem Diaz in Tinian or Louis Ogo yeah, in yeah. Luta, exactly. So um, it, it took all of us really, and, and many more beyond that, but those were the, the main people that were part of this. And uh, through them, just getting to meet these wonderful people has just been an experience that I treasure and I hope to keep those friendships and my admiration of their art alive uh, for years and years to come. Aww. Well, that's, that's, that's really sweet. You talked about how uh, it, had, it includes the entire archipelago, you know, and I think one of the areas that most of us are least familiar with is what's up there in the Northern Islands, especially when it comes to Latte Stones. Can you share with us a little bit what this book includes? Yes, and so we're very pleased, and this was part of uh, the mission as well, is I hope that in, at some point in my life I will get to some of those Northern Islands. We all Regan, do. Hagen, <laughs> yes, right? And if that doesn't happen, I know that I will have at least seen the Lati from Aww. some of those areas. And that meant a lot to me. And part of that is really important because in different parts of the islands or uh, between the islands themselves, Lati are different. I mean, the variety is amazing. And part of that is, is that Imanatsa Motna or, or Chamorros from the past they were using uh, rock that was relatively close by. They might quarry it from a mile away. Like in Gumataga, they actually quarried that from like a mile away. Those haliki maybe weighed 70,000 pounds each and they moved those a mile to where they then erected them. But and how did they do that? <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> that's, that's the, the big question. question. Yeah. Um, we've got some theories in there, but, uh, but we also wanted to make sure to give people kind of the gift, if you will, of being able to see these lati in these different areas. So we do have some photographs of lati quarry and lati from Surigan. And in Surigan, so as we get up farther north, it's more volcanic. In Surigan, they have what they call tabular basalt, and it's a volcanic rock that that forms in these kind of slabs, these uh, thin slabs of rock. And so the lati there 
I still don't fully understand them myself, but uh, they take these thin volcanic rock slabs, which are very strong, and they create a lattice out of those thin slabs. So it doesn't look like, um, at least from the ones that I saw, that it's the, the thick, robust capstone. It looked like they used what rock was there and, and they replicated a lati there. So we have photos of lati in Pagan, uh, Sarigi and I mentioned, and we just tried to, to get different islands. Even um, Agigan, which is off of Tinian, most people, including myself, hasn't, haven't seen them in person, but it is also on my bucket list. <laughs> But there are some amazing lati that are there. And so not only do we provide the photographs, but one of the things that I think is such a gift as well is we provided these um, kind of bird's eye views. So I think in archaeology, they're called plan views. And you have these overviews. So you can see Alagwan, which is one of the larger villages that survives anyway. And you can see how 53 Ladi house sets were set out in this one area of, of Rhoda. And we have that for Agigan also off of Tinian. Uh, maybe most people don't know that there were Lati there. And so it shows how they were lined up at that particular island. And so we did that at a few different sites to show people what a Ladi village uh, might look like if it was along the coast versus if it was inland versus up, if it was up on a ridge uh, and things like that. Very interesting. What particular or are there any um, particular excerpts from the book that stand out to you personally um, that you felt were either especially significant or just kind of blew your mind when you found out <laughs> or inspired you in some way? Well. I would say in some ways the first section is my favorite because I always love hearing the wisdom that's been passed on through the generations. And so if you have Mama Chai who's 85 years old, I think she might have just turned 86, but she's still vibrant, right? Um, and still so active going out there, she still collects Amit and uh, practices as a Zoanti or a Surahana. So being able to hear medicine. from her about how, you know, how she feels and how to behave in sacred spaces, uh, being able to hear for, from Gualu Fading, who's over there in Luta, about how his parents raised him to safeguard the Lati. I think those are some of the things I treasure the most. And then, of course, there's that other side to me also, though, like in the the second section, I mean, I love finding out about our region. I love finding out about our connections, uh, the ways that we're similar, the ways that make us a little bit unique from each other. Um, but each section is kind of my favorite, right? Because I love the art. <laughs> it's so beautiful. And then, of course, I have to care about going forward. So um, many, many sections, though. Uh, some people might like to look at and see how we've actually taken some of this and put it in ebook format or in apps to try to engage the kids right in their own culture so some of those are, are pretty exciting as well you mentioned some of the people you've worked with um, who are your major partners for this uh, project that you'd like to acknowledge yes well we're incredibly grateful because uh, as many others have probably said this project wouldn't have been able to occur without them so we have the Northern Marianas Humanities Council, we have Humanities Guahan, we have the Guam Preservation Trust, we have the Guam Visitors Bureau. Um, our legislature in Guahan were, were actually the ones who um, placed the money from the, the Visitors Bureau. Um, there's a, a certain sort of a way that they um, place that project with the Guam Visitors Bureau, so we're grateful to them for that. And then each of us that were involved, from our graphic artist to Dr. Julie Liston and myself, we each have a small businesses on the side, or at least I used to. And we all just donated um, hundreds of in-kind hours after that. 
Well, the good news is people can find a poster series uh, about this project at the Joten Kizu Public Library, who is actually hosting our interview today. Thank you to them. Um, and you're making the book available here at the library. Where else can people, for example, purchase a copy of this extraordinary publication? Yes, uh, we cannot wait until it can be showing up in bookstores and things like this. Uh, COVID and other things have slowed down production. And so uh, it isn't available there quite yet. But what we did with the project is, you know, too often I have seen these publications and they have like a one of printing and then everybody has to try to scramble and find some used book version of it. And we wanted this to be able to continue to be something that served the community for years to come. So we took, after the project finished, we took it and we essentially donated it to Guampedia so that it would be available on Guampedia on their website. And so they have a gift shop, one can go there and purchase it. And also because we wanted something good to happen with the proceeds. So 100% of the proceeds go towards supporting the work of Guampedia. And Guampedia is taking the proceeds from this and committing them to broadening. I mean, Guampedia, it sounds so Guam-centric, but really they try to work and cover uh, the Marianas uh, more holistically and Micronesia. So they are committing the monies from that towards continuing to expand the Marianas and Micronesian sections. Wonderful. Any final thoughts before you go? And could you also share your contacts for people who might want to get in touch with you about this project? Oh, great. Yes. Well, my final thoughts are, as I've mentioned a couple of times, it really was such a labor of love. And I have treasured the time that I have spent with everybody. And I'm so incredibly grateful for just what they are doing as a, a person or a promoter or a maintainer of the Chamorro culture. Um, and my contact numbers, well, the other part of that was that I could easily have uh, like a volume two or a volume three <laughs> because there are so many, you know, and that was one of the hardest things was uh, creating those boundaries and saying, okay, this is, we're done now, this is it, right? Because we knew that there are still so many amazing artists, still so many amazing cultural practitioners and others to hear from. But my contact numbers or, or information is I can always be gotten a hold of through the Guam Preservation Trust. They are an institution, so they are always uh, easy to get a hold of and they can always reach out to me. And my email address is, basically it's my name and I have a long name, so it's kind of a long email address. It's K for Kelly, G as in girl, then marshtitano at gmail.com. That's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me is either through Bond Preservation Trust or just sending me an email. All right, so G, uh, I mean K for Kelly, G for girl, marshtitano at gmail.com. Yes, Guam as in girl. Thank you so much for not only your time today, but for helping to spearhead this project that really is so significant for our community and is significant not only today, but I believe for generations to come. Thank you, Kelly, Dr. Kelly. <laughs> My pleasure, Hagamas. Our guest today has been Dr. Kelly Marsh Titano. She is co project coordinator for Laddie of the Marianas. Uh, it is available on the website of Guampedia, or you can read it at uh, one of your local libraries here yeah. in the Marianas. This has been Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry. Your Humanities Half Hour is a production of the Northern Marianas Humanities Council, funded in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, or recommendations expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the Northern Marianas Humanities Council.